song, and I have the honor of being with you. In our opening session, I'm going to go over my long list of thank yous um, and some general conference items, and then Alex Simmons, our technical program chair, will go over the exciting technical benefits we have in store for you all over the next few days. Um, after Alex, we'll hear the president's address from Robinson Nickel, who's our Georgia IT president. And then following Robinson, we'll have our main speaker, a keynote address to our president. So let's um, I did want to recognize a special guest, Lisa Green, back, um, who's currently the president of the Southern District. So this is her first time at our seminar. So let's make sure to show her. Our theme this year, Other Places Will Go, feels particularly appropriate for this conference. Um, based in our Dr. Seuss childhood, this theme exemplifies the tremendous growth and opportunity that is the Georgia transportation market and how we as transportation professionals can choose the path to improve. Throughout the years, we'll innovate and create, we'll choose the right path more than the wrong path, hopefully. And most importantly, most importantly, we'll do it all together. So I'm super excited for this year's conference, and I look forward to all of us. Um, for those of y'all who have planned this conference before, you may have taken the village. So I'm super thankful for everyone who has helped me put together this year's conference. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to thank Alex Simmons, our technical program chair. Some of y'all may know this, but Alex and I actually met at the Georgia IT Leadership Program in 2017 where we went whitewater rafting and we rescued an overturned raft of non-ITE folks. Um, <laughs> needless to say, after doing that, putting, to de putting together a technical program is no problem for Alex. Um, then I'd also like to take a minute and thank our host and registration chair, Olivia Zubinich, um, for putting together everything related to registration for this event, replying to all of your emails and phone calls from a lot of you guys, and most importantly, dealing with Star Chapter, which is our registration program. Um, special thank you to Paul Sloan for handling all the AV items. I'm super grateful for not having to think about technology at all. And then thank you to our sponsorship chairs, Jackie Kava and Joshua Brown. We couldn't have this event without all of our sponsors. Um, and Jackie and Joshua were the organizers of all of them. And then also thank you to our scholarship, scholarship chair, Andrew Lewis, who has dedicated his time to gathering donations to help the next generation of the traffic engineers and transportation planners. Okay, so our Sunday activities, I know these were yesterday, but I wanted to give a quick shout out um, to these special events that make summer seminars so fun for those first time attendees who will hopefully become repeat attendees. Um, the Jimmy Roper Classic Golf Tournament, uh, presented by All Traffic Data that occurred yesterday morning. Um, huge thank you to Mark Bovine with All Traffic Data for organizing the event. I know I can always count on Mark for all things related to traffic counts and golf. <laughs> Sunday evening, I hope you all join us for the welcome reception and the annual Cornhole Tournament presented by Control Technologies. Our former Georgia IT president, Chris Maddox with SEI, organizes a family-friendly event every year. Um, and I actually don't know who the champions are, but did we unseat our three-time champions? We did, okay, okay, nice. If y'all need to pick up your cornhole boards, they are by the white tent. Thank you. Um, on Monday morning, this morning, we had our 5K run and walk organized by the John Walker. Is he in the room? Oh yeah, the John Walker over there. Huge thank you to John for putting together another great race. When Andrew Heath told me he wasn't attending this year's conference, I made sure to spread the word that first place was up for grabs for anybody so that they had plenty of time to train. <laughs> Our children's obstacle course and events are happening this morning and they're organized this year by Morgan Kennedy, um, the mom of Brennan Woods and wife of Clark Kennedy. So huge thank you to Morgan. Um, if you have any questions, please see the registration desk for the parents program WhatsApp QR code. Tomorrow morning, we have our annual Sand Castle competition for the children. Shout out again to Morgan. Um, and we have prizes and awards for them as well. The tennis tournament begins at 1 p.m. Thank you to John Karnaski. Is he in the room? Yay, thank you, John. 
for organizing that, and please sign up at the registration desk and report to the King and Prince tennis court if you'd like to play. Um, our volleyball tournament, which is also tomorrow afternoon at the same time, um, is presented by National Data Services, and it also begins at 1 p.m. on the beach, so thank you, Jody P. Jody, okay, thank you, Jody P. for organizing the event. And uh, um, we have, we don't have a, quite as many teams signed up yet, so I know you guys are all just spending your time figuring out who you want to play with, but be sure to sign up at the registration desk um, before tomorrow. So after an afternoon of events, please join us at 5 p.m. for the John Moskowa Scholarship Reception and Auction, which will be held in the Dell Ballroom, which is where y'all just had breakfast. Um, Andrew really worked really hard to get these donation items together. The silent auction starts at 5 p.m. and then the live auction will begin at 6 p.m. And we will be serving adult beverages beginning at 5 p.m. to help loosen up y'all's pocketbooks. And remember that all the money being raised is for student scholarships. Andrew, did you have anything you wanted to add? Okay, well, is this mic working? Hello? Many of the people in this room, so I'm super grateful. We've got an awesome list of things that we will be auctioning off for those of you who are not familiar. Um, Dane County gives the, the rundown, but we'll, five o'clock will be a silent auction, uh, like she said, over in the Delegal Ballroom. Um, you do just need to register. Uh, I don't have it out yet, but check back later at the registration desk. There will be a sign up there to register for the auction. Um, you don't have to have the money on you to pay right this weekend, uh, but do the do the bidding, uh, and then at 6 p.m., that is where we'll have the live auction um, that Andy uh, Flager over there uh, will be our auctioneer. Again, um, all of this has been donated completely free of charge by individuals and by companies, and then all of the money that you guys bid to, to buy these items goes 100% into scholarships, which we give out at the end of the year. I know we have some individuals, I see Ron here, I'm sure some others, who have received these scholarships in the past this is just scholarships for students here in Georgia who are interested in entering the transportation industry. It's a great way to support our young students. It's a great way to build that relationship with the next generation with ITE uh, and to get them engaged. So please don't blow off the auction and please come and, and spend your money. It's gonna be awesome. Thank you, B. And I know Andy has been practicing his auctioneering skills all year just for this. And is drinking. <laughs> Andy's drinking. <laughs> Um, the children's events will also begin at 5 p.m. in the retreat room, and the teen events are going to happen in Solarium. Um, so there will be child care while you guys are making sure to spend all your money. Um, following donating a lot of money to the scholarship auction, y'all can proceed to the banquet and eat your feelings. Just kidding. <laughs> Reminder, so the banquet is going to be buffet style this year, which is different than it has been in the past. Um, so essentially everybody will move directly from the auction room, get your food, and then come into here. Um, sit down and have the banquet and then after that we will be doing our dessert and dance social which is featuring island sound dj michael king on the star of the dance floor sean coleman <laughs> <laughs> and then finally i just wanted to take a quick minute to thank all of our sponsors of um, our diamond sponsors all traffic data atkins croy kci tillinghorn nv5 and bhb we couldn't have done any of these events without you um, same with our platinum sponsors. I'll try to read them all off. 360NS, AECOM, Arcadis, Atlas, Control Technologies, HNTB, Jacobs, Tech and Wood, Michael Baker, Quality Counts, Dantec, and New Telecom. Our gold sponsors, Gresh and Smith, Mar Traffic, and Pond. And then our silver sponsors, CHA, CoStar, Greater Traffic, HDR, Herman Hill, NDS, C3. SLTS, Temple, and Wavetronics. And then finally, our exhibitors, um, they have donated a lot of extra time and energy to this event as well, so make sure to spend some time out there, just outside this room, looking through all their exhibitor booths. Um, we're super thankful for all of them. Um, just quickly by the number, this year we had 224 registrants, which was uh, a lot, and then 128 guests. Um, it's the most registrants and guests we've had since the pandemic. I didn't actually compare numbers to pre-pandemic, um, but we're super excited and everything was really full last night. Um, 
We had 21 online attendees, 32 sponsors, and nine exhibitors. So thank you all for coming. And now I'll kick the transfer to Alex. So the technical program, we're excited about the program this year. We have 11 sessions. Uh, we have 42 presenters, um, consultants, GDOT, we have MARTA here, ARC, um, Federal Highway, several large local municipalities. Uh, we're so grateful for them. We know everybody has jobs. We know everybody's working and, and for them putting in extra time to create these presentations, to come down here. You know, some folks, it's, it's last minute, they're not able to bring their family. So. Uh, we appreciate the sacrifice and their willingness to come down here and present. Um, one thing to note, so there is a road safety audit workshop that will involve some walking around um, Wednesday morning. So we've been asked to tell you guys, dress accordingly, um, maybe grab a water bottle and, and be ready to have a good time there. Um, all right, PDHs and AICP credits. So we have PDHs for all the sessions. Those will be located at the front of the room, so be sure to grab those. Any questions or concerns on that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, AICP credits. So we are in the process of finalizing everything for CM credits for our planners in the room. Uh, we will have sign-in sheets for all the sessions, so please be sure to sign up. Uh, we're finalizing everything on, um, on the website so that you guys can go in and claim that information. But again, just make sure that you see the sign up sheets for those. Um, five sessions, five sessions for CM credits and we're looking at around six, uh, six three quarters, almost seven hours of credits for you guys. So like I said, we're looking forward to it. Happy to have all the presenters down here. Looking forward to a great technical program. Um, like I said, hope you guys have fun, enjoy it. featured a mentorship panel, and uh, that goes in, in the theme of the year that we've had with um, sharing the, the knowledge and the ideas with the younger generation and kind of getting those you know, connections made. We featured a, a group project with transportation board game, as you see there, and social activities, um, like dancing on the dance floor, which we're going to see Sean over there later. <laughs> All right. We also had our Southern District meeting this year in Savannah, and Jody Peace did a great job planning that with Kelly Mears and, as well. And um, another very heavily attended conference. We had over 101 Georgia section members down there, which you can see in that picture, uh, just a lot of people made it down there, which was pretty cool. And I honestly thought that might impact this conference a little bit, but I don't think I think we've got a full house here as well. So it's just speaks a lot about our section. Um, we had two really awesome awards to um, receive there. We got the Section of the Year, got awarded the Section of the Year for Southern District, and Joe Gillis got the Outstanding Individual Activity Award. 
So congratulations to him. Oh, and we got to celebrate our 60th birthday. So um, ITD in Georgia was, was started in 1963. So this is actually the 60th year that um, we've had this section active. And that's part of you know what we've been talking about a lot this year is just the legacy of leadership and, and uh, all the past presidents that are here today. If you wouldn't mind, I just would like to ask you to stand up and be recognized. was everyone in Southern District was so excited that they sang happy birthday for us. And then the second thing was uh, the, the, the best team in Georgia with two back-to-back -back national championships is the Savannah Bananas, not, <laughs> not, not, not the other team. So. All right, and on top of that, we've had a whole slew of new monthly meetings this year with Sam Harris has done a great job planning these. We've had new meeting venues at a movie theater out at a pavilion in Avondale the other day, and uh, record-breaking, over 150 attendees at a monthly meeting. I've never seen that in all my time in ITD, so great job to Sam for that. And we've had a couple social events so far, and uh, thanks to Madison and Nate for planning that. So I wanted to take this opportunity as well to recognize um, recently the ITD International organization had uh, future young leaders to follow. You may have seen it in the um, ITD journal recently. So basically this is a program that says the, the ITD young leaders to follow program was designed to recognize and highlight talented ITD members under the age of 35 who have already made a mark on ITD and the transportation industry and are leaders to follow in the years to come. So this year our we had someone from our section get recognized and, for this, and so Amy Turner, I just want to say congratulations. <laughs> and on top of that, because we have such a great section for leadership, we actually had two other former members that have moved on to other locations, the Meredith Emery, and Melissa Gindy were also recognized in that same group of candidates. So I uh, just wanted to recognize them. So oh, the places we've gone and oh, the places we are going. Uh, coming up next month, we have our international ITE meeting out in Portland, Oregon. And then we have a, a joint ITE, ITS Braves game coming up in August, so keep an eye out for that. We've got the annual golf tournament coming up in October. Leadership program starting in October as well, and the technical exchange in November. So, thanks everybody for being here. And with that, we'll Stewart is the president and CEO of Kia Georgia's manufacturing facility in West Point, Georgia. And he is responsible for all operational facets of the four model assembly plant. They employ over 3,000 team members and has the capacity to pr produce 340,000 vehicle vehicles annually. A graduate of the University of Alabama in electrical engineering, Woo! Countess McKinnon. <laughs> <laughs> one, one person? <laughs> He began his 30-year manufacturing career with Hughes Aircraft Corporation before moving into automotive at the Mercedes-Benz Assembly Plant in Vance, Alabama. In 2008, he was hired as the senior manager for Kia Georgia's General Assembly Shop, where he was a key figure in developing and implementing the Kia Way and the Georgia production system as core practices of the facility's operational system. Since his hiring, he has held positions as company's director of quality, Vice President of Quality, Chief Administrative Officer, and Chief Operating Officer before assuming his current role. He's very active in his community, civic and educational organizations promoting individual development and providing leadership through service on multiple boards and committees in various capacities. He currently sits on leadership boards for the Georgia Chamber, LaGrange College, LaGrange Academy, Georgia State Workforce Development Board, 
the Carter Center and Georgia Association of Manufacturers while chairing a key committee in Georgia's Electric Mobility and Innovation Alliance. He's an avid golfer, could have used you yesterday, and a loyal supporter of the Alabama Crimson Tide. We won't hold it against him. And he and his wife, Dana, reside in the of Georgia. They have four children and four grandchildren. So please welcome Mr. Stewart Campbell. state capital about what happened over the last two years, but it's okay, I just pull up other things to bring up. <laughs> well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I think it's kind of interesting. Your theme is, oh, the places we go. Well, I would add on the other side, from my side of the business, oh, how the auto has changed, um, which is impacting what you do each and every day. So the other thing that I would briefly mention is it's, for me, a little bit of a heartfelt thing to be here. Um, this is what my father did. What you do is what he did for many, many years. He actually worked for Temple. And I made an acquaintance this morning that was just reflecting back on something, you know, you find times in people that you've met over the years and then lo and behold, in uh, the east side of Georgia, you run right into these same people 40 years later. So it is great to be here. Um, I don't have to tell you that the world of transportation is going through a dramatic shift. Um, that not only applies to Kia, but it certainly applies to my plant in uh, West Point, Georgia. It's a very exciting time um, as we are preparing now to launch the first battery electric vehicle in our facility. We are currently a um, ICE only plant, but as of second quarter next year, we will build both in exactly the same assembly process. Additionally, the state of Georgia is also exploding. Um, and it's been become a hub for uh, battery electric vehicles, battery assembly plants, et cetera. Um, it's creating thousands of new jobs, which is also stressing our economies um, in a good way. It is expected that by 2027, that there will be 1.1 million cars built in the state of Georgia. Something that hasn't been seen. And I say that because quite honestly, a lot of people don't realize what's happening. My facility, 340,000, I built as many as 372,000, not me personally, but <laughs> my team has. Sometimes I feel like I built all of them. Um, you got 340,000 there as a capacity stated. This new facility, if you saw it coming in in Bryan County, that's part of the uh, Hyundai family. Uh, we sit in an umbrella with the Hyundai Motor Group over the top, and you have the Kia and the Hyundai and Genesis brand all sitting underneath. That plant's capacity will be 300,000. It is a fully battery electric vehicle. It will be operational next year. If you want to see something come out of the ground, come talk to one of our two companies, because when we commit to the timeline, that timeline will be met, if not improved further. Then you have the Rivian facility. So you add up at about 400,000 there, that's where you get to 1.1 billion. But I think also more important, and probably fitting to your agendas, it's about three quarters of a million cars will be electric coming out of the state of Georgia. That again does not include the battery electric facilities, or excuse me, the battery plants that are already located here or currently under construction. So it's quite a change. Then you take the larger landscape, which is why I shared this. What is happening in the southeast? In the southeast, there are at least 20 manufacturers for international OEMs. And those international OEMs back in, two, in 1979 were only producing about 1% of the total vehicle population in the U.S. Today it's more than 45% of the cars come from international OEMs. And it's all clustered. In Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, you put in Mississippi and Kentucky, and if you want to go a little bit north out of the southeast into Indiana, it is amazing what is happening. And we're all continuing to grow. The great thing about this map is it shows you where we're located as Kia. We are right on the I-85 corridor. Our property sits between exit two and exit six. So there's about a four mile stretch of where my plant facility sits. And then if you take the plant, our sister plant down in Montgomery and move all the way over here, you can see that straight line going across the state. But inside that is a supply base that comes with whatever I bring. It's about seven fold that I'm bringing from supply base to help support us. 
Also along this corridor, yeah. also along this corridor, we're part of what is called the Ray. The Ray is an 18-mile stretch of interstate along I-85. It's named after Racing Anderson, who was the founder of Interface Carpets. Um, and it is a real-world proving ground for new technologies in vehicles and communication devices. From Kia Georgia's part in the Ray, we sponsored the solar power uh, charging station that's at the uh, Welcome Center as you cross the Alabama line. It also has a tire pressure monitoring system at the visitor center that will give you information that you have to react upon. We've also partnered with uh, Panasonic and the Georgia DOT. And we're running a program with vehicles made in our facility that are providing real-time data updates as cars transport up and down the I-85 corridor. So from that data, the DOT is looking at how to utilize that in further capacities, and it's been a great part uh, partnership. So speaking of Kia Georgia, uh, we've been busy this year. We actually- Yes. Excuse me, I went too far. I'll come to that then. Um, this past April 6th, we made our four millionth vehicle out of our facility in Georgia. And we've only been making cars for about 13 and a half years. We make a car every 51 seconds. That's how you get to 340,000 plus. We started production with the Sorento on November 16th of 2009. And for the third year in a row, Kia was named the number one brand of J.D. Power Vehicle Dependability Study. That's an important metric for us because it tells us, you, the consumer, how you feel about our product. We get those initial studies, but we're also looking for the long-term impacts. What do you see and what is your experience? And this study represents a three-year period of evaluation. During that time, the K5, which we used to call the Optima, it's a mid-size sedan, um, has maintained that title as the number one brand. That's important to our team because that tells them what they're doing is the right thing. It's helping you get to where you need to go, but it's all meeting every expectation that you have about that consumer product. Our sales have also continued to be very strong. In 2022, Kia set a new retail sales record. In the market competitive segments that we're in, we achieved a 9.1% market um, achievement rate. That doesn't sound like a lot, but when we started this company in 2008, we were right at 3%. So we've tripled that amount. We build the Kia Telluride. We are the only manufacturer for that in the entire world. Um, that is a special vehicle, one in my career. I have never seen a car do what it's done. It started off at a planned capacity of 60,000 units a year. And we have since doubled that capacity, and we still have trouble meeting demands. It is a once-in-a-lifetime vehicle. We also make the Kia Sorento. We're on our third generation of that. We make the Kia Optima. We're on our third, or K5 now. Uh, we're on our third generation of that. And then we've added a fourth vehicle in February of 2022, which was the Kia Sportage. We currently employ 3,200 people on our site. Our site, meaning the Kia Georgia facility. If you add the supply base that is on our facility, we have 6,500 people on our site every single day. We are located in West Point, and its population is only 3,300. I'm twice the size of the city every single day. So there are options. Um, I'll come back to the uh, commercial now if I can make it work. So what I thought I'd share with you, and I'm sure many of you saw this during the Super Bowl, this shows the Kia uh, Telluride. This car was actually launched in 20, at the Super Bowl in 2020. Um, and there was a young man in that video um, talking about how the revitalization is going on in West Point. This was a city that was just devastated from NAFTA when the mills left. When we arrived, there was over 13% unemployment. Today, there's 3% unemployment. So we think that we've had a significant impact on this. Yes. You remember your favorite Binky, right? Binky. You forgot the Binky? I forgot the Binky. Try 
magic. Hashtag Pinky Dad. Oh, you guys, he forgot the Pinky. So it's a never-ending quest to satisfy our children. <laughs> so we've proven what we can do in a three-row SUV with this particular vehicle. Uh, in April of this year, we announced at the New York Auto Show that we would build the EV9, which will be a fully battery electric vehicle. It is a vehicle that is of the same exact size as the Telluride, actually a little bit longer. Um, so I thought what I would do is let you see this video and then we'll talk a few stats on this. So it too, as a vehicle, has the same potential as the Telluride to be a game changer. It will be the most sophisticated vehicle that we've ever built, and it certainly will be the largest in the Kia family. It will be the first ultra-competitive EV that Kia is providing to the US, to the US market. Um, we do currently supply the EV6, which is a sedan. It will combine all the elements of the Telluride, which was the 2020 World Car of the Year, with all the EV elements of the EV6, in this past year it was named as the World Performance Car of the Year with the GT version. As a first three row, seven seat EV for Kia, it will mix the capabilities of technology and refined elegance. It is slightly longer than the Telluride. It will have 5,000 pound towing capacity, 379 horsepower, 516 feet of torque, and a capability to go from zero to 60 under, six, uh, under five seconds. So it's gonna be a fun ride. Um, I think you probably, some of you have driven in the EVs, it's that instant power that you get from these motors on the individual wheels and not having to combust fuel um, that takes people by surprise without a doubt. It will have the fourth generation battery technology meaning it will have the ability with the level two charging system to go from 10 to 80% in 25 minutes. Uh, there is a lot of talk about this product and you will continue to hear more in the months ahead. But my favorite thing about this is it will be built here in Georgia and specifically West Point, Georgia. Some of you may have seen the article that was released um, last week. So we've announced a 200 million plus dollar expansion of our facility to accommodate this into our facility. And that in also will create nearly 200 new additional job, tax-paying jobs for Georgians. So it's an exciting time to be in transportation and it's going through big changes on many fronts. Some that have been in the planning for years and others have been brought on by the pandemic issues. From the current automotive industry in, uh, viewpoint, we think that there are three areas to be considered, understood, and prioritized. We have to focus on recovery, retooling, 
and renewing of our industry. So let me reflect a little bit on the recovery. The pandemic was something that arguably none of us were prepared for and hopefully we'll never ever have to see again. I would walk into my office at 6.30 in the morning and I'd have a plan for what I was gonna do for the day. And as an industry, much to, uh, similar to yours, this is how I'm gonna operate month to month. And by 6.45, I'm throwing that plan out. And by seven o'clock, I'm throwing that plan out. And a lot of that is traced back to what I suspect you had similar problems, supply chain issues. This causes us to reflect on what we need to do differently and how we need to do it better. We can no longer sit idle and wait for things to just happen. We have to be out in front. There have been times with our unwavering partners of like Georgia Department of Transportation and the Georgia Ports Authority that we've had good close communication and those partnerships are what helped us to get through a very difficult time. Understanding what each other had to have had to have to make your business operate, at least in this state of Georgia, is one of the huge benefits that we see. The traditional application of PFMEA discipline has been utilized in many areas of our operation to better understand how can I do something? And the key words in that are how can I do? Many on my team are tired of hearing me say, stop telling me how I can't do it, I only wanna hear how I'm going to do it. We have to think differently and you learn by doing so. Learn by failure is not always the most optimal thing, but sometimes you have to learn and apply lessons. We all hold our standards very sacred and they're generally not open to compromise. I would tell you that first and foremost. The most predictable thing is if I build it the same way, I know at least what I'm gonna get out and I have a starting point to go backwards. So we're not open to changing standards, but the problem is we have to think about how to change those standards. And during these three years, we really deconstructed everything that we had and looked about how we're going to move forward and apply those lessons to improve our overall quality and efficiency. When we look at the industry right now, you can easily recognize a dynamic that demands a retooling of sorts. We have to operate in two lanes of preparation, preparing and preparing the future current present situation, but also preparing for what the future is. The industry is on the cusp of a change it has not seen since horse-drawn carriages. The integration of mobility solutions of tomorrow requires a very different solution and skill set. If you think about where cars are, and I only go back to 2009 when we started building cars, there was a lot of technology, but every single year, I know from our perspective and I know from my competitors, We've added more and more technology to communicate car to car, car to other um, related issues. And that is not slowing down. When the labor market in our great state and literally across the, the uh, nation presented serious challenges in attracting talent, the mobility industry and its additional challenges had to convert how do we diversify those skill sets in the existing workforce that are now needed for EV production. As previously mentioned, the state of Georgia has taken a proactive approach when it comes to EV. Governor Kemp's EMIA, the Electric Mobility Innovation Alliance, which focused in the areas of infrastructure, I think something probably near and dear to your hearts, supply chain, workforce preparedness, and that's all near and dear to our hearts, innovation and policy. In our opinion, that is the right direction, and Georgia is well prepared. Each of these EMIA areas is important and significant to the success of EVs. It's about skilling up the current workforce in preparation for the future. It is front and center to each of our operations. It's educating team members on the transition and ensuring they're continually educated on fast-paced fast -paced changing technology. And it supports each of our individual missions to meet the current needs of the public. We have to look at what the workforce needs in the next 10, 20, and 30 years. Those future Kia Georgia team members are sitting in local classrooms across the region, and we need to develop and establish an environment that will cultivate that talent and generate interest in advanced manufacturing. This is necessary for us to be prepared for our future, not only in the U.S., but certainly here in Georgia. 
We've taken a variety of approaches through the years when it comes to that development by setting up local pipelines where we need to achieve growth and prosperity. Before we ever rolled the first assembly vehicle off, our first vehicle off the assembly line, we recognized we had a shortage in the maintenance area. Individuals who could go in and work on our advanced equipment and understand how to prepare, uh, repair them when needed. So we partnered with Georgia Quick Start in the initial days to help develop that workforce. With that development, it got our students exposed, those students plus even uh, individuals in the uh, school systems exposed to STEM education and what potential uh, pathways could be. We worked with local business and industry and we established a college and career academy that we call THINK. It is a charter school that received millions of dollars in funding with the same, the simple basic idea of us developing who the workforce will be in the future. Since that time, we've engaged with the school to sponsor and hire interns and work in their areas of interest, allowing them to experience the application of their fields of study, but in a real world environment. Now that's individuals, not only in the technical colleges and the four year schools, but also in the high schools. So work-based learning. Some of those very individuals have graduated and moved on to technical colleges and universities from the high schools and some have come straight to work for us. Education has always been our principal objective in preparing the workforce of the future, but our need for maintenance skills, as I previously mentioned, couldn't be delayed. That program evolved to where we made a maintenance certification program. It started off with Georgia Quick Start and has now transitioned over into the Technical College in our local community, which is West Georgia Technical College, part of the TCSG system of the 22 colleges around the state. It provides individuals a pathway to grow their skill set. There's team members from our own uh, production system that apply and say, hey, I want to advance myself and have more potential earnings. They go in and learn um, in the areas of electrical, PLCs, pneumatics, um, hydraulics, everything that's needed to run our particular equipment. It takes about two years for them to complete that program, and to date we've graduated north of 70 individuals. The impact that is felt on our side is that we're able to keep our production system operating at a very efficient rate. Again, that's how you make 340,000 cars. It also provides future opportunities for advancement of their education. These MCP participants, as we call them, are able then to complete an Associate of Applied Science degree in precision manufacturing and maintenance. They're developing their skill set which helps us to retain those individuals as we develop them individually. There's no doubt that this program is only possible due to our longstanding and successful partnerships with Georgia Quick Start and the Technical College System of Georgia. And then we believe that that's how Georgia remains the best state in which to do business for nine straight years. But we've also gone a step further, as I previously mentioned, back into the education system. Let me share with you a quick video. Team members, and welcome to March. Let's start this week with a look at this year's A World in Motion Jet Toy Competition. This competition is for fifth graders and is one of the key events each year for Kia Georgia's sponsorship of the phenomenal STEM program that has been implemented into kindergarten through eighth grade classrooms throughout our area. Here with that story is KGTV's Faye Jones. Well, thank you, Jay. I'm here at the World in Motion Competition here in Columbus, Georgia, and I'm here with Alicia Bach of SAE. Alicia, tell us a little bit about what's going on today. Absolutely. So today we are here um, to do a competition with Kia um, for fifth graders using um, a balloon-powered car.
Ocean is a program that's run through the SAE organization. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Uh, it is being implemented in, or has been implemented in actually the local kindergarten through the eighth grade. And again, it, as um, previously mentioned, it's about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But I think what's more important than that is teaching skills, how to, uh, teaching children how to work together, how to problem solve, how to be analytical. Um, and we see that, I would imagine, in many of our workplaces, that that's not so easy to do today. But these kids are excited about it. This event um, that is shown in the video is held every single year, so it's a competition. And it's not, it is about winning for them, but it's also about how they're working with their classmates. To date, more than 90,000 local students have been impacted by this program as we've contributed more than $3.6 million in funding to support it. What I realized actually this year um, in Columbus was the kids that were there weren't born when we started the program. So it goes, time goes by quick, and the kids that were there that many years ago, some of them are hired. So it is having an impact. We just have to be more um, purpose, purposeful in what we're doing with it. So that's one event. Um, the next one that I want to show you is a, a, another avenue, and it's called um, Green Power USA. So Green Power USA does basically the same thing, but as you can see, these young individuals are um, racing a, more or less an electric go-kart. Um, they buy a kit and they work together in teams to uh, build that uh, mobility device. Um, it is a very highly competitive class in the, certainly in the middle schools and soon in the high schools also. We think that it's the right time for us based on where we are as, as a company and certainly as a state. Again, they're learning how to work together, read data, make analytical approaches on how to solve problems with the end hope that many of those individuals will be the ones working in our own businesses and industries in the future. It is a competition, so it does require them, as I said, to work together. They meet and compete at different school events. I think the other unhidden characteristic of this is when you go the amount of adults that are there with these children, watching and cheering them on. And it's not just the parents, it's the grandparents, it's the siblings. And so the siblings that are there are saying, well, I want to do that when I get into that grade. So there's a lot of positive side benefits to it also. Programs like these are critical in running and building our next workforce. Um, the initiatives will continue to be a big part of our individual workforce development as far as a, our company. I would encourage you to look in your local areas and I identify what those opportunities of how I can participate. No matter how small they need that initiative if we need them to come into our particular places of business. Talking with industry leaders around the state, we've all realized we can no longer sit on the sidelines and wait on the education system to just deliver employees to us. If we are in five years, we'll all be asking ourselves, what did we not do? So get a seat at the table, not at the back table, at the front table. Provide the opportunities. Encourage young individuals to come in and, and be in co-op programs, workplace-based um, programs. These are how you get them to understand what you can do. In our industry, and maybe in some of yours, there's this stigma about a dirty, safe, un, you know, nasty kind of place. I encourage any and all of you to come and see what we do. You can eat off my floors, and I've been operating for 14 years. We have to take the leadership and how to dispel that so that we can have those future employees. 
The last thing is about renew in our industry and the evolving markets. Today's workforce, we have to think differently, and we know that. It's been a challenge over the last three years. I personally think that what we saw in these last years, much of that was coming between 2027 and 2030, but it got here and we were unprepared. What we also have to think about is how do we make these small changes as previously mentioned before. There is no blanket solution because it's ever evolving. The things I do today will not work next week. And I, trust me, I've experienced a lot of that. It's, it's dependent upon that group of individuals as to what they expect. One of the things that I always said, and I ended up eating my words, as we've all been taught in our lives, never say the word never. Well, I should have listened to my mother. We had a three shift operation rotating system. And I said I would never change it. January 1 of 2023, I changed it and went to a set shift pattern. It has worked out fantastic, better than what I could have ever or anybody in my uh, staff could have ever expected. It helped a different workforce setup that we never really understood. So don't get yourself, I would encourage you to don't say never. Think about how you do things differently. Uh, as I said previously, it's something that's going to continue to evolve. So what, I, what we did in January, may, we may have to tweak it just a little bit more. But be open to what those changes are, but certainly don't lose your identity either because that's what made you successful. We spend a lot of time and effort in preparation for this, um, and it did work out. Um, it has helped us to be better prepared for where we're going. Um, our system is what we call Plan S. What this uh, slide shows you is a little bit of background. Kia has this plan S of about mobility solutions for you, the consumer, wherever you are. The solution in West Point, Georgia, and LaGrange, Georgia is very different than the solution in Atlanta. So there's ideas about EVs. You have the air mobility, which would be great in Atlanta. Um, you have fuel cells. Um, you have purpose-built vehicles like up in Peachtree Corners. All of these are on the table from our strategy. And then our plan is that we will bring a new EV into our lineup every year until 2028. And that's just as far as we've made the plan right now. And certainly that's all dependent upon how we solve these really critical issues, which are about infrastructure, to eliminate the concerns as it relates to EVs. And we look forward to working with all of you and how to solve those together. We will continue, um, as you've seen, and is I think fitting to your uh, segment, is about these advanced driver assist systems, the technology going into these cars as we move more and more towards autonomous driving are going to continue to evolve. We're also going to see smart technology uh, implemented in many of our businesses. We're already implementing uh, processes and systems in where a team member that maybe is five foot seven and the next one is six foot one, we can adjust the power based on who's working in that particular area. So there's a lot of opportunity out there for us. And again, it only makes and retains that person. So I want to recognize your importance in the state of transportation and how we manage it. I can tell you from a Kia perspective, we greatly appreciate what you do and we look forward uh, to you continuing that work. Um, we are open for tours for anybody that wants to come see how an automotive factory works. Um, I encourage you to look on kiagorgia.com and there's ways to sign up for public tours, but I'm sure there's a few people that have my email and you can drop me an email and we're glad to give you or some of your group however you want to. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Stuart. That was a great presentation. And it's, it's really tremendous what you all are doing with the younger generation of students. Um, a, quick, a few quick housekeeping items. Um, at the 5K, somebody uh, left their phone. So it's at the registration desk. Um, it is an iPhone, so I don't know 
we Android people can just not bother checking. And then um, somebody yesterday left a hat at the pool, and that's at the King and Prince Lost and Found. Um, so we have a little bit of a break, and then the next session starts. What time is it? 10.30, so snacks are out, and check out the exhibitors, thank you. Yeah.